Hello everybody and welcome to the 1875 podcast. It's me, Andy Watson, and I'm going to be speaking in this episode to Jason Wilcox. Hope you're all enjoying the uh, 25th anniversary of our greatest, probably greatest ever day. Um, to become champions of England is not certainly something that a lot of football fans can, can say, um, especially through a boy in, in the 80s like I was. I was 10 years old when we won the title and memories of that day are pretty scarce but I do remember being in my auntie and uncle's house and when we were crowned champions obviously Redknapp had just scored that free kick and I was cheering my head off and they all thought I must have been a United fan because they didn't understand the the maths of it um, and realising that we didn't actually need to, to win at all or even draw as long as United didn't and those um, few moments of confusion where I thought that I might have been wrong um, but then being around the town or being in the town when everyone was just beeping the horns, there was people outside the houses, there was people in the streets everywhere, there was decorations put up in the next few hours, just people celebrating. And obviously I don't remember people celebrating through the night, but I'm sure they were doing. And uh, what a great day that was. And and to remember it, I've, we've got in touch with a key member of that squad, um, Jason Wilcox, who wasn't who wasn't in the eleven on the day, and we talk about that quite in depth. Um, but someone who certainly saw the was at the club from uh, the late eighties, so went through promotion, uh, went through building towards that title win, and then stayed and became captain afterwards and until we we eventually were relegated and he moved on. And we talk about all that. We talk about a little bit of his time with Leeds and what he's doing now as well and some questions from you guys as well so i hope you enjoy this interview in which we begin by talking about whether wilcox is still involved in football thank you so much for your time um today jason we've got obviously the 25th anniversary of the title winning season coming up soon so i'm really excited to have an integral part of the squad kind of talking to us a lot of people won't know though if you're still involved in football or not yeah, I'm very, very much involved. Um, so I'm currently the academy director of Manchester City. Um, obviously, I retired um, 2006 um, after a lengthy playing career and um, took some time out of the game and then um, got an opportunity at Manchester City. Um, worked as a volunteer for a year, just working across all the age groups and then Got an opportunity with, well, my old boss was Scott Sellers, who's a, a sort of a, an ex-Blackburn player. So it was quite apparent, and played in the same position as me. So it was quite apparent, really, that sort of I looked up to him as a, a player and then became, he, became, uh, he became my boss and um, got a lot of admiration for him in terms of the way he developed uh, young players. And still I've got a lot of respect for him. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's now at Wolves and... Um, still speak to him regularly, and it was a, it was a key part of my coaching development. So um, worked them for a year um, as a volunteer. Got the opportunity as to lead the under 13s. Uh, jumped up to the under 18s. Um, then became the technical director, so looking after the full football program. And now the, I'm the academy director, so I'm going uh, greyer by the minute. Yeah, in this, in this yeah. role. Especially with the situation that we have going on at the moment, yeah. actually, it's funny. It's funny that you mentioned Scott Sellers early on. There, I actually spoke to Scott last week, um, doing this similar sort of thing that we're doing with you. And his podcast will be out on Saturday, so you might want to pick that one up. Um, I spoke to him about all of the some of the summer stuff we're going to speak about as well, the promotion season and and his career, and and obviously a little bit about his transition into coaching. So it's, I did wonder whether that was kind of a link between you two. Um, and it's good that you kind of kept in touch and that he was able to facilitate your development as a coach as well as a player. That's kind of that's kind of fortuitous, is it, in a way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, let's say, I, I think at that time when I broke, when I was breaking through into the um, into the Blackburn team and I was a, a young uh, apprentice, if you like, then, not scholars, it was an apprenticeship, you know, it, every time I was joining in with first team sessions, um, Scott was somebody that he was probably the most talented player in the group at that moment in time. The fact that he was my position and 
Um, you know, I, I had to make my inroads on the right wing initially because he was obviously on the left wing and then he left, I think, to join Newcastle, which gave me my opportunity. But always there to give me advice. Um, knew that I was his position, but I think some senior players, when they see young players come up, they don't really give them too much time. But Scott was always there giving me giving me the time, uh, the support, advice. And um, I took a lot from that. And like you say, I think when... When he was um, the head of coaching at Manchester City, for him to take the time out and um, pass on then his, you know his his learnings and the advice from coaching, it was again it was quite quite surreal journey actually. So um, let's say I learned learned a lot from him in all areas. And so, how does kind of being obviously a very prescient question? You're involved in the academies at the moment. I imagine it's vastly different to how you were, how it was when you were coming through at Blackburn. So, how did you end up with at Rovers, and and what was it like coming through the the youth system there? Yeah, I mean, at the time, um, I mean, I, I was I was in my Sunday league team. I was probably the last one to leave. I, I had lots of interest from lots of clubs. Um, Man United, Liverpool, they were all watching our, our Sunday League team and I was the one that was probably the last to go and um, finished up actually having a trial at Manchester City and they wanted to sign me on the same day. And because my my dad was working, I sort of wanted to make sure I spoke to him first and went back for a second trial, had a disaster and it was a case of um, don't ring us, we'll ring you type of situation. Mm. And... Um, what I did then is, is obviously it's disappointing for, you know, when you're 15 and you feel as though time's running out. So my dad wrote probably 25 to 30 letters to all the clubs in the Northwest. And I got one reply from Jim Fennell mm-hmm. or from a guy called Fred O'Donoghue, actually, who um, he then took me, uh, I had a trial, went up on the Sunday morning um, to Pleasanton and literally within um, an hour and a half of, of, of having my trial, the, they wanted to sign me and I went back on the Monday night, signed my schoolboy forms and the week after I was playing in the Lancashire Youth Cup final. Which, so it was quite quite bizarre really, the, the, the speed of how everything turned around and I signed the scholarship forms or apprenticeship forms, um, Got offered my got offered a professional contract after after one year, so I had a two year apprenticeship. Got offered a, a, um, a professional contract after after a year, and then um, was lucky enough to train with the first team on a regular basis. Um, had to be patient for my debut, so it, you know I was always I looked after one of my jobs was to look after the manager, his staff, Tony Parks, the physio Jim Fennell, and cleaning their boots and things. And, um, you know, I always used to badger the manager and, and say to him, when am I going to get my debut and th- this type of situation? And, you know, he, he was always trying to um, give me encouragement, but also trying to suppress and try, and try and bring some realism to, I think all young players think that they're ready and they're not, you know, I think you're never actually ready. When you, when you play that first team game, you look up at the clock after 10 minutes and your lungs are bursting, and it's never it's something that you've never ever experienced. So, yeah. I then played. I started off really well in my, my Blackburn career. Um, it's really funny actually talking about Scott. I always remember my first my debut, and I was a young kid, and the ball rolled behind the the goal at the Blackburn end, and I always remember going collecting the ball, and some supporter ran down to the fence and said. Um, Wilcox, you'll never be as good as Scott Sellers. So I thought, well, thanks very much. That's my journey to first, that's my introduction to first team football. And um, you know, I, I started started off really well. We had a literally, I created a goal. It was a top of the table clash against Swindon, and I, I, from the kickoff, it was a it was a kickoff. It went back to Nicky Reed, I think, at the time. He um, passed it out wide, and f- f- for the for. Um, for him to hit me first time was was a surprise, you know. <laughs> which I'm only joking, Nicky, because he's a bit he's a bit bigger and stronger than me, so I don't want to come up against him. So, um, yeah, and I ran down the wing, crossed it, and um, 
Simon Garner scored a goal in the first minute. So that set me up for my debut, really. And I think what happened then was, you know, I was a very slight kid and um, the demands and the physical demands and mental demands of first-team football were, you know, after 10 games, it was taking its toll and my performances started to dip. Um, You know, it's been widely known that, you know, my relationship with the Blackburn fans in the early stages, not all of them, but the more vocal ones, was quite up and down. Um, yeah, so I've got a question on that. Mark Whittle yeah. on Twitter said, like, how did you deal with the stick from some of the home fans as a young player? Did it actually make you more determined to succeed in the end? Yeah, it's really interesting because I, I try and talk to the to some of the staff now and some of the younger players on on what happened to me because, you know, I was playing playing reserve team games and playing against first team players and they couldn't get close at the time. And then when I came to a first team game, I think, you know, some, but it only, it was only after nine or 10 games, the anxiety and lack of confidence and questioning yourself and trying to please other people. And I had to almost um, find a solution to myself or else I was going to disappear out of the game. There was no yeah. doubt. And I think it happens to all young players where, suddenly the, the expectation and the demands on you are so great, and, but no greater than the demands that you put on yourself yeah. and the expectations you put on yourself. And what I did one day, I remember, the, I remember, I can't remember what game it was, and I remember them reading my name out before the game. And mm. I was stood there and the whole ground, the, all the home fans booed. Mm. And it felt like all the home fans, it probably wasn't. Because I know that, you know, when you, it was, a, it was a split camp, if you like. Some supporters appreciated the work that I did, some didn't. And ultimately, I did take it personally at the time. I really did, because, because it was my club and, I, and I, I worked so hard to get into the team. And, um, and I worked my socks off. My teammates would, would you know, would say, would, would all say that, that, you know, in terms of, working hard and doing my job for the team. I was a team player, not, mm. not an individual player. And I felt like it wasn't appreciated. And it, and it created this situation that needed to be resolved. And the only, way I could, the only way I could resolve it is making it into a little bit of a, rather than trying to please everybody, almost making it into a war that it was me against them, really. And I remember walking to the... To, the, the game was about to kick off, and I remember walking twenty to thirty yards into the towards the Blackburn end and just clapping them sarcastically, mm. wrongly actually, because ultimately they, they they paid their money to watch the team play and they do every right to their opinion, but it didn't feel like that when I was an emotional nineteen year old. Yeah. And um, I clapped them sarcastically, jogged back to the halfway line. I got even more booze actually when I was jogging back, but it, but it, something happened and something triggered me then that I, I played with an arrogance from then on that it was me against them. I'm not here to please them. I'm here to show them what I can do. And I, I, I even took that on an, onto another level that when I wanted a new contract or, you know, I had a young family and I, and I wanted um, a new contract, more money. And the board said, no, you're not having any. I even made it into a war that every time I created a goal or scored one, it was always a case of I'm going to put myself in a situation where I, where I have a bit, bit more control. And um, it, was a, it was a healthy relationship, that, because the board, um, the football club was run by some unbelievable people. Yeah. But ultimately, I didn't understand that it was a business as well. And, you know... Um, but now I do. I'm firm, you know, I, when I look back at my experience at Blackburn and I look back at the club, it's an unbelievable football club and I'll always be grateful and never, ever will I say a bad word about, about the fans, about, the, about the, my experience. The, the experience that I had made, made um, put me, set me off in good stead for the rest of my career. And um, like I said, you know, it's, it's so nice to go back and be part of a, be part of Blackburn's history, and I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of the of the time that I had at Blackburn. I was, I would love to have, when I finished playing, I would have loved to have gone back there and coached, um, um, but it didn't quite happen uh, for one reason or another. I tried to, um, but you know, I was blocked, um, 
and this is why I find myself at Manchester City because, like I say, when I look at when I look at my back of my career and they say, you know, what was your club, Blackburn? Blackburn was my club just because I was there for 14 years before I left and experienced the ups and downs, captain the side, we, you know, got promoted, won the Premier League, got relegated. I think I've experienced every emotion at, uh, with 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 the with the supporters. Yeah. And and the loyal um, people who work at that football club, because I think um, the staff who worked there at the time, who were supporting the the team, the first team, they were as much of, of part of the the success and the journey as the players and, and the manager. And I think that, um, that journey that we went on for four or five years was just was just sensational and, and something that I'm not too sure many players actually ever go on. No, it certainly wasn't. You joined at a very interesting time. And so if we delve into some of the specifics of that time that you talk about there, we'll start with the the promotion season in 91-92. You actually made the most league appearances that you you ever did for Rovers during that season. Um, When you, what are your memories of that kind of, that campaign? Were you still playing, were you playing on the right and Scott was on the left? And yeah. and, And how did that kind of, work out during the season and then obviously we lost six games in a row um, towards the end of the season and we dropped out of the playoff places. Uh, what I want to know from you is that your own personal feelings at, the, at that point because you must have been looking around yourselves as a squad, you'd been flying, you were a ridiculous number of points clear and then all of a sudden you're out of the playoff places. Was it panic stations in the squad at the time? Yeah, I think it was. I, I don't think, it, I wouldn't say it was panic stations but we couldn't understand how we weren't winning. Because, like I, I think we were something like fifteen points clear at one point, and we had we had such a we had a, 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 a squad with um, youth experience. Um, you know, we had David Speedy, Gordon Cowens, Kevin Moran. You know, we had so many. Um, so, you know, you know players who've got unbelievable experience. Then we had um, you know Mike Newell dropped down from from the Premier League. I think then. Um, and he was a sensational sign in one of one of uh, Kenny's best, I think. Um, you know, Tim Sherwood. Um, you know, there was just so many, so many um, players that had a wide range of experiences. And I did play most of the majority of my my time was on the right wing. Um, Kenny was my was my idol as a as a young kid you know I, I idolized him I was a Liverpool supporter an armchair supporter probably because they were, were winning everything um so when he when he was rumored to be did you hear the rumors of him possibly coming in and yeah, were, you, I mean, were I was, you excited by that or? yeah when I was a young when I was a young player um you know Jim Fennell when I was when I was in the first team squad under Don Mackay or I was playing in the reserves um Jim Fennell would always say to me, um, you know, Kenny's here today or Liverpool are here today. Or, so I knew that they were, they were watching me when I was a young kid. Um, and Man United, I think. And um, so when Kenny, when Kenny did um, eventually take over, like I say, we'd, we'd heard the rumours, um, but when he eventually took over, it was, he, I always say he ruled with fear, not fear in an aggressive way. He, in no uncertain terms, I think he, you know, nobody, nobody crossed him. Nobody wanted to upset him. And he was always a manager who would let his opinions be known, but very, very, very much centred on team spirit and work ethic. And I think with his team that he had there with Ray Harford, who was, who was an unbelievable guy. Forget unbelievable coach. He was an unbelievable guy. And we had Tony Parks as well. Um, it was just a, um, it, was, it was just a fantastic time. You know, we were still training at Pleasanton then. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunate, fortunate for me. You know, there were there were, you know, lads who had come through the ranks with, um, who were leaving, and, you know, Kenny decided to stick with me, and he was him and him, um, Kenny and Tony. Were, were a big part in this period of um, my progression into a into a young kid that was trying to please everybody into this first team player that belonged in a, into the, in the first team and felt part of it and I think they 
you know, when, when, um, when I was going through this period of time where the fans were, you know, not, like I said, I keep, I have to repeat, not all of them, but some of them, the more vocal ones were, were giving me a tough time. They were, Kenny was saying, Kenny was always coming out into the media and saying, you know, good things. And he stuck by me. And I'm like, say, I th- I'm, I'm glad he did. Um, because ultimately you need to, you need to play through these things and you need to get through it as an experience. And um, I'm glad I did. So you, was, actually, yeah, incredible. you actually played a major role in kind of snapping that losing streak that we had, because I think you scored is it the opener. Well, we played Tranmere uh, at Prenton Park, I think, and it was a 2-2 draw in the end and you scored in that game. So that snapped the series of six losses in a row. We were still kind of on that cusp of not making the playoffs, but I presume... Yeah. That it was now that we'd stopped losing. I presume there was a feeling there in the squad that it would all come together and we'd get back in there and and get back into the playoffs. Yeah, I think we always we always felt like if we could get into the playoffs that we we would we would we were the best team and we we would we had a chance of we had an unbelievable chance of going up. But like I say, I think probably dig- digress slightly away from your previous question that we were we were around fifteen points clear and then we sort of had a few bad results. Um, and it was like it's like being on a glass mountain. It's very difficult to get off. I think when people say that winning becomes a habit, losing does as well. And yeah. you know that you could sense the anxiety in the crowd, the board, the players. You know, but we had ultimate belief that we were good enough to to get promoted. That's the top and bottom. And we on that season, I remember playing in. Um, I remember playing the last game of the season at Plymouth away, and we needed a result. Yeah. And I always remember. Um, I think David Speedy, I don't know if he scored a hat-trick that day or... Yeah, it was a hat yeah. It was a three, we won 3-1. Three, um, you know, this is, where, this is where the big players step up. And David Speedy was, was a fiery guy. Um, when he stepped up, scored a hat-trick. And I always remember him coming off and high-fiving Kenny. And um, I got injured during that game. Yeah. Um, I think it was what my, my future teammate, Nicky Marker, went straight through me and uh, bust my ankle. So... Um, I actually missed the the playoffs. Um, was desperate to get back to the for the final and thought I was going to be. I was close, but unfortunately, it wasn't to be, and I missed out. I missed out on it. Um, you know, so so um, was it, were you were you just as nervous as the rest, or worse because you had no control over it? Uh, going obviously, let's just talk about the playoffs. We were we were two 0 down in what thirteen minutes against Derby, and then. I think it was another case of the lads looking at each other and seeing that the big players stepped up. Scott scored a free kick and then Mike Newell scored and we ended up winning that 4-2 and we held on in the second leg to get through to Wembley and then we were up against Leicester in the final and going down to Wembley, I presume you were part of the party that went down to Wembley on the coach and stuff. Was it nervous or again, were you just looking around thinking we've got the players to win this? Yeah, absolutely. Fully confident. I don't think... you. Get, I, I don't think... Um... You, you you go down into a game like that and don't um, believe that you could that believe that you're going to be the, the the winners. I think what was frustrating for me was the fact that I couldn't play a um, I couldn't play my part in it after um, obviously being part of the the first team all season. So yeah. um, that was disappointing. I always remember I always remember going out before the game and we had these. I don't know if you can remember, we had like these green suits, light, lime, light green suits. Yeah. And um, I always remember going out, looking at the pitch before the game and I had this suit on and a bird must have flown over the top and did its business on me, on my suit. And it's almost <laughs> like uh, I had this raspberry, blueberry, blackberry stain all over me green jacket, which I was extremely proud of wearing at the time. So I had to take that off. Yeah. But but if but I just thought well never mind that's give, that's going to bring us a bit of luck so and it did on the day so it was a it was a, a day of um, mixed um, mixed emotions I would say because obviously you you were going up into the Premier League the league that everybody wants to play in and you know I didn't quite feel as though I'd been part of that final day so. Um, at least you were going to be a Premier League player and that would have been that was the first season of the Premier League and it meant that Rovers were the founding members of the Premier League and Football League which is you know looking back quite a big thing for the club and I think it's only a couple of other teams that have done that so that 
you must have then th gone away for the summer though and thought well you know i'm going to be a premier league player um, was it actually a big thing for you because it was totally new no one really knew whether Premier League was going to be successful or not and obviously it's become such a massive thing now and did you instantly kind of feel at home when you started playing in that top division that yes this is where I belong yeah I think I mean at the start um, I didn't I didn't start off I didn't start the season I don't think as as number 11 I think um, I don't know whether Alan Wright played a couple of games can't really remember too much about it, but I know that I wasn't in the team right from the start. I don't know whether that was form. I don't know whether it was injury. I can't remember. Um, I'd like to think it was because of injury, not form. But um, eventually I broke through. And um, for me, it was just like playing. It was just a, an unbelievable experience playing against these top teams. It didn't matter whether it was the Premier League. For me, it was, Divi it was League, Division 1. Yeah, it was a top, it was a top, top division. Yeah, and um, I think what we what we then went out, what we did then was we were winning games and playing these top teams and um, against top players. And I think that experience was just incredible. Um, in that at the end of that season, we finished fourth, mm. um, which was a great achievement. Um, so was it part of the plan? That was it said in pre season. Look, we're we're not coming in here to make up the numbers. We're we're planning on you know being kind of competing at the top end of no, the division. It's just a case of seeing where you end up. Yeah, I don't ever, I don't ever remember talking about it. Yeah, but then I, but then I think when we finished when we finished fourth and we were a bit of a surprise. I remember then turning up the following year and some new players. Um, the 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 intent shown by um, by Jack and by Kenny and Ray and uh, around the signings. I think then we, we were chasing Man United um, for, for much of the season. We just ran out of, ran out of steam at the end. Um, yeah, so I was listening to a rival podcast and they did the 93-94 season in depth and they barely even mentioned Blackburn. They were saying how Man United was so far clear. And yes, you know, it finished up eight points, but... After we beat Villa at home on April 11th, we went joint top at that table. Yeah, no, yeah, we were we were pushing them. We were absolutely neck and neck, and Man United at that time knew that we were pushing them neck and neck as well. And they they were just more attuned to um, being in that situation, and it's the experience of being in that situation than we were. And I think, like you say, I don't think we had the biggest of squads. The emotional roller coaster at, at, at that time of chasing, and then we just fell away at the end. But I think we all knew, and we all we didn't say it, we never talked about it. But I think we all had this sense that this is a, a real special time, and we're going to win it. We're going to win it next year. And I think that was our all ultimate aim was was to win that league. And I think we we knew that with the teams that we were playing, with the the way that we were playing, the way that we were um, dispatching teams. I think we had we knew that we had a real chance, and I think we turned up the next summer. No one mentioned pre winning the Premier League. We just set off mm. and um, we went on a great run. Um, and ultimately, everybody remembers that last day, yeah. uh, and almost replicating the going up at, at Wembley, going up into the Premier League. I missed I missed the final day through um, injuring my cruciate ligament. I missed the last five games. Yeah. Um, which again was quite incredible, knowing that I missed I missed the uh, Wembley final, and I, and I thought, is this what my career is going to finish up like? Well, uh, I sort of um, miss out on just on the final final bit. So again, I had a, I had a day of mixed emotions, um, where you know, so proud that we won the Premier League, but ultimately so disappointed that. Um, I didn't um, contribute on the final day and I played 36 games that season. So I'd made yeah. a contribution, but I didn't feel like it on the day. Well, yeah. in a way, like, you look back on that and I would say that you made the bigger contribution because, you know, when you left the squad, we were, you know, when you had that unfortunate injury, we were top of the league with, by a couple of points and we, we could see it was, you say about 93, 94, where we fell away, it felt really everyone felt really tight, seemed really tight. We were in the stands feeling a bit tight and especially that Newcastle match. And I think there was the Everton away where we were, we went 2-1 up. I don't know if you were actually in that match and 
we went two yeah. nil up, didn't we? After like ten minutes, and yeah. from memory, we seemed to get battered for eighty, and just held yeah. on. And we had a, I think we played Leeds as well, and they scored in the last minute, and it just all seemed to be getting very tight. Did you? Did, were you feeling the nerves, even though you weren't kind of part of it for the last few matches? Yeah, I think um, you know. I, I always remember. I always remember. Um, I don't know what game it was. It, I think it, it might have been. It was an evening game where we needed to win. I can't remember the. I can't remember the name of the game. But it was almost like the last couple of games of the season. And I remember driving um, to the game and seeing the feeling the atmosphere outside the ground, and it was it, the atmosphere was was electric. And I, I can remember thinking, I don't know, I didn't realise it was like this out, outside outside the ground after mm. you know after the you know before before a game and. Everybody at that time, I think, could sense the the nerves because it was natural. You know, everybody was nervous. You know, we were on the verge of winning the Premier League. So, but ultimately, we we had the we had the players who could who could cope with it. And um, you know, whilst we didn't have a, a great running, as I say, we we were fortunate enough that you know, Ludo McCloskey had a, an unbelievable game on the last day of the season. But it's not one or lost on the last day of the season, as though you know. And I know it's an old cliche, but you you win the Premier League over the over the course of the season, and whoever wins it deserves to win it. That's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Talk about that day at Anfield. Um, how much did you actually know what was going on at Upton Park at the same time when you were sitting there watching watching the game in front of you? Yeah, we didn't know a lot. Um, you know, we kept getting updates. Um, you know, from some of the Liverpool supporters who around us, and you, you know, you're half taking things with a pinch of salt. But and I think as it got towards the end of the game, um, I think when people were coming over and um, hugging Kenny and Ray, and Ray and Kenny started hugging, then that's where I think it, it actually sunk in. And you know, the fact the fact that we'd, we'd won it was just an incredible an incredible feeling. And then I'm, you know. At the time, obviously, I was just recovering from the ACL. I remember trying to jump out the the dugout, and hmm. um, uh, you know, and, and I was like you say, trying to trying to look after my knee at the same time with people jumping all over me. So it was it was um, it was a bit of a surreal time, to be honest. Yeah, Do you, but you got to lift the trophy on on the pitch and stuff as well. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, um, you know, whilst. I was in my me, me tracksuit. I travelled with the team that day, met them at the hotel, travelled with the team. And I think, I don't know whether I said this before, but I felt, I felt it was quite a funny day for me because I felt, I felt really sorry for myself on the day, but really proud and really um, emotional, I think, because, of, you know, I played 36 games that year and, yeah. and I didn't feel, on the day, I just didn't feel part of it at all. And sort of... Um, didn't really know how to express myself on that day, you know. And I think, you know, at, at one point I said, you know, I didn't even want my medal. It was ridiculous, really. Looking mm. back, it was just, it was just um, how I felt on the day. And um, thankfully, Kenny and I mean, I would have got my medal anyway. But to miss out on that day of not receiving your medal is something which I would have regretted for the rest of my life. And thankfully, Kenny and Tim Show, I think, got got a grip of me and um, shoved me to the front. So. I'm pleased they did. They're going to talk you around because, like you say, you would probably look back on that as a yeah, as a absolutely, yeah. So, but were you involved in the celebrations afterwards, or was it just did you just feel like you weren't part of that as well? And well, no, the... involved, no, I'm you know involved in the celebrations. I think that's one thing that we had. We had a really tight team spirit. So, um, you know, no, I think when we certainly when we got into the the dressing, I think everybody was was um, down in the champagne. So it was an amazing, amazing time, amazing, um, some amazing memories. And uh, like I say, to, to actually, to actually, um, if there was every, any ground that you'd want to win it, um, knowing the rivalry with, with Man United at the time, we were a magnificent football club, by the way. But I think, what, you know, it would have been at Anfield. And um, like I say, the, the, the connection with um, Kenny and the club, just, just you know, it was almost like we were playing at home. 
So, uh, yeah, so was it true that, that you know could you feel the Liverpool fans kind of when Red Knapp's free kick went in and were they like, oh, oh crap, <laughs> we don't want the United to go on and win it? Was it could you feel that from them? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about that. I didn't. I I certainly didn't feel it. But what I did feel at the end of the game was just the the way that the Liverpool fans stayed in the stadium. Yeah, you know, whilst we were whilst we were, we had the trophy, I think. Um, that was a real special moment as well. And then it was all round to Shearer as the career sort his fence, was that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, so that was obviously, you know, our, our biggest kind of triumph in, in the club's, you know, definitely recent history. Um, I suppose you're quite well placed to, to answer this next question. We've got a question from Glenn Entwistle from Twitter and he said, what differences do you see between Rovers and Man City as to why City have been able to maintain their presence at the top when they obviously, City have gone a very long time without winning the, the title as well and then they obviously had that Aguero moment and we're, it can't, it's not necessarily just money because obviously we had the Jack Walker at the time, you know, obviously money's changed a lot since since that time but we we had a you know a healthy budget at the time so what what difference is why did we not kick on and and city have stayed at the top um that's a really good question and and one which i I don't know the direct answer to i think but if you can i think one of the things that happened with us was um very quickly the the manager sort of moved into a director of football type role Assistant manager t- took over. Alan then left. The, so there was there was there was quite a um, a lot of upheaval at the time. Um, and I'm I, I, I don't know whether there was there was a hint of complacency that we felt as though we were going to continue to win it. Um, you know, some of the signings I can't remember who they were, but maybe it, maybe didn't settle in as quick. Um, because if you think about it, you know, and I said this the other day, the signings there weren't there were there were a few big name signings. You know, when you consider Paul Warrest, David Batty, Tim Flowers, Alan Shearer, but I don't think there were too many big name signings other than those four. Mm. And you take one of those big big name signings out, who left Alan, um, the manager leaving. Like you say, I think that probably played a played a a huge a huge part because when did you guys hear about that i think that you know that's probably the biggest point for me is that can he obviously made the decision to go upstairs and he thought well ray's been doing obviously obviously ray was doing a lot of the coaching anyway or all the coaching and he probably thought maybe it wouldn't make that much of a difference but having read like kind of ugly sort of biography he was a mad keen on playing in the european cup for liverpool loved the european cup Obviously, never really got to managing it because we had the the ban at the time when Liverpool were winning the title. So I just didn't understand why he didn't want to keep the team at least through the the when we were in the Champions League. Um, you say about the signings, we signed Adam Reed from Darlington, Matty Holmes from West Ham United before the season started, and then added Lars Bohinen in October, and then Chris Coleman in December. But you know, that's not building a legacy, is it? Why 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 was that ambition? Uh, what, when did you guys hear about what Kenny decided to do? I got asked about this the other day. I can't really remember because at the time I was heavily involved in saving my career, really. Rehab. Yeah, um, yeah and rehabbing. And um, and it was all, it, it seemed very grey, you know, like um, Kenny was on the training pitch sometimes, not, not others. I, I think it was... It was a difficult situation, I think, for for everybody. I can't. It's not. It's not clear actually what what happened and you know the timeline of events. And normally, I'm sort of good at these good at these things. When, you know, I've got a good memory of around things. But for this, it just seems very blurry to me. Maybe that's and, and like I say, I don't think Kenny obviously had his reasons, and we'll probably never ever know fully why he made that decision but ultimately yeah. you know I think we've got to respect that and um, the fact that the fact that we um, haven't or Blackburn hasn't maintained that success is probably down to lots of you know different reasons new ownership um, don't forget the, the club were in the Premier League for a long time um, 
the new ownership have have taken over, um, and I think and I think have done an amazing job despite what everybody thinks of. of um, they've stayed with the club, and I think it would have been easy for them to. They probably had admit themselves that they probably made mistakes. Trusted people that um, have not been um, not advised them in the right way, but I think. I think one of the things they've done is they've stuck by the football club. When I think most would have, most would have jumped. So, yeah. um, like I say, it's it's uh, it's 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 not easy to see um, to see the where they are now. But ultimately, uh, um, they've got to get try and get back up to the Premier League as quickly as possible. Yeah, and that's going to be tough. You mentioned about trying to save your career there in, in that time with the the bad injury that you had. You managed to do that. You came back in that season and got, came back kind of... You, were you like delighted with the way that you came back? Because obviously you seem to come back kind of running, really. You got into the England squad um, and made your debut in May, I think, 96, just before Euros, and had an absolute stormer. Um, were you actually disappointed to kind of miss out on the Euro 96 squad then? Or was it a case of did Terry Venables say, "Look, we're bringing you kind of for experience and you know just trying to impress us"? No, I was at the time. I remember, I remember sort of coming back from the injury, and I, I, and at the start when you come back from a lengthy injury like that, you, you know you get the adrenaline carries you through. And, and I remember um, my performances started to suffer. I knew that I knew that they were suffering a little bit, and whether it's fatigue, uh, mental fatigue, and I remember Ray Ray Harford having a real pop at me after one of the games in a in a really in a really um, caring, positive way in front of all the players, and um, you know, and. and I think I was just so frustrated with with the situation, and that I couldn't. I was still I was still on the road to recovery, even though I was playing first team football. I was still, um, I was almost playing first team football without playing the reserves. So I I literally played sixty minutes in a reserve team game on a Thursday night, and then I was thrust into a first team game against Man United at Old Trafford in the first team. And I always remember. I always remember. Um, I always remember this. I always remember the ball um, being played to me, and Roy King shoved me over the barriers, and um, I got up and smiled. He got up and smiled, and it was quite, you know, he was testing. He was testing me, which, which I knew he, I knew he would. Um, ultimately, I think there was like. Um, from from myself, there was a realization that until you get that first tackle, you're always very very apprehensive. And mm-hmm. um, Roy Roy gave me that first tackle after five minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I say, I went skidding down the skidding down the boards. He just gave me give me one of his glares, which was which was really funny. Um, so going back to the point, I, I was almost doing my recovery and getting used to playing whilst playing. Whilst playing in, in big games, and I was quite frustrated that I hadn't been able to make the impact for the team that I wanted to, and for Ray. And um, he gave me, a, like I say, a severe talking to, and um, I started then just to actually appreciate the fact that I'm actually back on the back on the pitch, and it could have been a lot lot worse. And my performance has improved, um, forced my way into the England squad, and I was when. When I found out that I wasn't in the team, in the squad for Euro 96, yeah, I was, at the time, I was absolutely gutted. Um, but looking back now, it was, it was going to be very, very difficult for me to break through. And if I, if I hadn't have had the debut that I, that I had for England, um, I don't think I would have been um, with the same high hopes, but but because I had a, had, a, had a really good debut, um, I thought I was in, even within, within more of a chance, and I put myself in, a, in within more of a chance. And you know, unfortunately for me, 
um, Terry had decided to go a different route, and I respected that. You know, I was, even though I was even though I was gutted. And you're the first England international that I've ever spoken to, I believe, in person. Oh, actually, no, once James Beatty in a nightclub, but that doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> in an official in an official capacity, um, what was it like, kind of, on like, joining up with the squad and on the day? Were you at, were you, you know, nervous? Was it everything you dreamed of? Do you just soak it? Do you take it all in? Obviously, you went on to have that brilliant game. And um, what was your preparation like for it? Yeah, I, I mean. Um, I got told, I got told by Terry Venables on the Friday that I was going to be playing, and I remember, I remember um, sitting somewhere near the front of the of the bus, um, nervous but really excited. This is something that you dream of as a kid. I remember Tim Flowers saying to me that you know enjoy every minute because no one no one can ever take your England debut away. It's always going to go down that you've played for your country. And, that's something that stuck with me. And um, on the day, I, re- you, you, I was once you once you get out there and you, I was always one for the build up to the games. Were um, I was always nervous, you know, on the coach getting to the games. But once we arrived at the stadium, all the nerves went, and I was just you know really looking forward to 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 playing and. Proving what I could do, and you know, like I say, when you play for your country, and you, I've always wanted, I always wanted to to sort of make that walk at Wembley. I always wanted to play an FA Cup final mm. for the, you know, when you're a young kid and you see that walk out from the dressing rooms behind the goals, and but to sing your national anthem and see your family there, my wife, kids, dad, uh, my mum and dad, um, it was very, very emotional. It's, it's in a, you know, considering as well the. You know, sort of nine months before it, my career was was almost in tatters. So mm. very, very emotional, like I say, um, but very inspiring. I mean, you know, to to wear the England shirt is something that you can yeah. only dream of. No one can ever take that away from you now, like you said, and yeah. especially for your dad, obviously writing all those letters when you were sixteen, seventeen, out to the clubs, yeah. and he must have dreamed of kind of how it's kind of gone for you and for him to be there as well like I say with the rest of your family must have been a great moment for you yeah yeah um before we kind of leave Blackburn and talk a little bit about Leeds and then wind up with some kind of fan questions um I just wanted kind of a word a word on two things first of all Tony Parks um I don't know if you are aware obviously he's very well at the moment and um we all wish him well and he's in our thoughts and prayers most days um he obviously did a series of fantastic jobs um caretaker obviously behind the scenes why was he able to regularly kind of come in and just stabilize the club so successfully do you think i think he i think he had the respect to the players and i think he tony tony knew the game inside and out he knew what he wanted he knew how to win football matches um and i think because he had the respect of the players, I think we wanted to do well for him, and um, I think it might be his first, his first game in charge as caretaker at the baseball ground. I think I scored my first league goal, and um, like you say, I, you know, I, I've sent I sent Tony a birthday message the other day. I don't think he's he's probably not received it yet, but you know, one of the, you know he, my first my first um, introduction to Blackburn Rovers was a was a training session on a Monday evening at Whitton Park and he was he was a, he was taking the training session and I can always remember um, the sharpness that he had in the session when he was demonstrating and things mm. um, very clear very passionate was really honest with me throughout my career um, was was always somebody that on hand to give me advice always um, Challenging me in a in a positive positive way, even though it wasn't always positive things he was saying. Um, so I had huge respect for Tony. Um, I think he was the manager as well who sold me on to Leeds United at the time. So um, you know we 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 had a we had a mutual respect. He was let's say very honest right into the end of that. I left Blackburn. I've met him since at various things and. Just a real top professional who um, 
would do anything for anybody and, and help anybody and uh, had a real a real love of the game, which is something that all sticks in it sticks in my memory. Yeah, and someone I presume whose coaching style and, and the way that he went about things has maybe inspired you in your coaching as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know all I all I try and do in my in my job now is is um, I mean I'm I'm not necessarily coaching all the time, but but uh, I coach a lot off the pitch and make sure that I give I help people and um, and I'm always there for the young players to, to give them advice and it's not always like I say it's it's not you can't sugarcoat sometimes all the information you've they've, they've got you've got to tell them straight and I think before you do that you've got to build up a, a really strong bond and a strong relationship that they know that you're doing it for for their own benefit and that's something certainly with uh, myself that I had that with Tony yeah absolutely um what a, what a legend for Blackburn Rovers and we all wish him well in his in his health at the moment. Um, the final thing for for Rovers um, was the, obviously we got relegated under Brian Kidd. Um, a brief one, really. Kind of, did you did you sense that coming? Did it was it kind of a long downhill thing, or was it something that's kind of shocked everybody? Um, yeah, I think I think it shocked us. I mean, I was captain at the time as well, yeah. and. Um, you know, no one wants a relegation on the CV. And we, we were, this old adage of being too good to go down, we had a squad of players that should never have gone down, but we did. Mm. And I think we all, we would all probably look at ourselves um, and scrutinise our performances that year and say that they weren't, they weren't good enough. Um, because I say, you know, for a club like Blackburn, that, you know, we... To, once you go down in that championship, it's very, very difficult to bounce back and jump back with all the money involved in the Premier League. And um, like I said, no, no one wants that on the CV, but it, it happened and um, some players left and, you know, it was, a, it was a, a case of rebuilding for the year after. Yeah. And the year after was when you got your, your move to Leeds. How did, how did that come about and were you... Sad to leave, I presume you were, having spent so long at, at Ewood, but um, how did the Leeds move come about and kind of were you happy to go in the end? Yeah, I think I think what happened at the time, I think I had Damien snapping at my heels as well. And I think um, the club were, Damien was my natural successor on the left wing. Um, he was growing in stature with every game. And I think the... I was aware of interest from other clubs. Um, I always saw myself as being a one-club guy. Um, mm. You know, I always saw myself seeing my time out at Blackburn and being be working in working there in some capacity um, after I'd finished playing. And um, it was my club, like I say. I, you know, I've t- t- seen seen every, everything at that football club. Um, but when I think what happened, what tipped it was when Tony Parks rang me and said that they'd, off, they'd had an offer from a Premier League club um, and that the club were willing to sell me. But ultimately, if I didn't want to go, I'd be welcome to stay. I think when, a, when, when the club are willing, willing to let me go and, and I found out what, which club it was, mm. it was only going to go one way then. And obviously moving to Leeds you know, United, which was another massive football club, completely different than Blackburn in many respects. You know, at the time, Blackburn and, and Leeds, they, they seemed to be going in different directions. And Blackburn were willing to, like I say, I, I didn't want to leave. It was my club. But when a, a club like Leeds United, um, who were top of the Premier League at the time, come calling, then there was only one way it was going to go. And mm-hmm. I, I, parted, I parted mutually. Um, I still have huge respect for everything that Blackburn Rovers did for me, all the staff, um, the supporters, um, you know, and I, and I have such fond memories of, of that time. But this was just going on to another another part of my career and that's how I saw it, that it was just, you know, I was 29 at the time. I've been at Blackburn for 15 years. So it was a long, long time. And I made so many great friendships, like on and off the pitch. So it was a wrench, but something that I just felt was right at the time.
and, and they'd built a, uh, a big, a strong, strong squad leads with lots of English players, and um, they yeah. were obviously getting into Europe. And you had a massive role in the UEFA Cup run, which was to the semi-finals, I think, and then Champions yeah. League to the semi-finals yeah. as well. Um, yeah. Conscious of our time, but if you just want to pick out a couple of highlights from those European nights with Leeds, they must have been special to you. Yeah, they were. I mean, um, you know, I think when you have these big European nights, there's nothing, there's nothing better than a than a, a European um, a European team coming to to Ellen Road or Ewood Park, wherever it is. Um, and to test yourself against Europe's best, I think that's what we did. I mean, the the, the game at Galatasaray in the semi-final of the UEFA Cup, mm. as it was called then, was something that was stuck in my mind. You know, this is you know this is when you know, unfortunately, two lead supporters lost their lives, and that was devastating for the football club. And you know, we went out there. There was a lot of a, a lot of. Um, Anger um, around at the time in the stadium and things like this, but the the atmosphere was electric and unfortunately we couldn't quite pull it off for the for the for the Leeds fans and their families, um, which would have been which would have been great. And let's like say the, the the tragic loss of two footballs, two innocent football supporters. Um, that game will all stick in my memory for mm. for two reasons: for the, for the families and in the. the the guys that lost their lives, but also the to play in a semi-final under those conditions was um, lives in my memory as well. Yeah, and you obviously played quite a few games for Leeds. Not as many as you did for Blackburn, so we'll still label you as a as a Rovers man. Um, but then obviously went on to Leicester a little bit, of Blackpool as well. But then moved into coaching. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times you would you would have liked to have. Um, maybe come back to Rovers in the coaching capacity, but it never really happened. Did no one from the club ever come back to you with an offer, or was there ever anything there for you in a non-playing capacity? No, well, at the time, I think when I when I finished playing and I was looking to ba- get back into coaching, I made some inquiries, but told that um, there was there was no space mm. or no no opportunity. So. You know, when you hear that, you don't hang around too too long. So I moved on to the next opportunity and, you know, rang up an ex-teammate of mine, Scott Sellers, who was working at Man City at the time and asked him if I could go down. Um, and I finished up staying staying for a year as a volunteer, working across all the age groups and then got my opportunity as uh, under-13s coach initially. And, um, you know, that's... that. You know, I'm thankful to Scott that he... he put his faith in me and um, he sort of helped me out on my coaching uh, path. Still speak to Scott a lot now and like I say, it was, it's quite ironic that he was the the guy that I looked up to on the on the pitch and then the guy that I looked up to when I went into coaching. So, um, it's, uh, well, I'll just um, finish off then with a couple of um, statements that fans have made. Um, Mick Doran said you're in his top five since he's been supporting the club since 1976. He said you're a grafter, he's in your t- top five all-time Rovers players. Um, James Flowers said you're Rovers legend in my eyes, one of his favourite players. Ian Stones asked me to pass on our respect. You did some great work uh, recognising your contribution defensively as well as putting in some great crosses. Um, qu- one final question, well, two final questions. Um, would you rather have played with Messi, Ronaldo or Stuart Ripley on the right wing? Oh, I've sh- I'll have to say Stuart Ripley all day long. Of course. And um, go on. Yeah, go on. Um, no, the final question was: Do you still kind of look over at Ewood Park, look out for our results, and you know how do you think that we're getting on under Mowbray? And do you see us coming back into the Premier League sometime soon? Yeah, I mean, I, I always look out for the results first and foremost. You know, I know, obviously. Working in, working in academy football now, I, I sort of I don't visit Ewood Park as much as w- what I would like, but um, you know I, I certainly visit the academy now. Is where the first team used to train, so it's every time I go back, it's uh, it brings back really really nice memories. So, um, but I think I think what Tony Mowbray's done is he's steadied the ship and he's brought some um, stability to the to the football club. There are, you know. 
obviously before the pandemic, they're just on the on the verge of the playoffs. Got an got a, a young kid that well, he's not a young kid anymore, but Tolson playing in the first team that I, who I coached as a as a fourteen year old, or a fourteen year old and an eighteen year old, um, who's got the potential to be a top player. So it's great to see him playing. Um, Jacob Davenport as well, who yeah. um, I coached as a uh, a young kid, you know, has has gone there. So um, some really some really fun memories. Like I say, it's it's uh, I don't get chance to go back too often, but whenever I go back, it's the same old Blackburn where you see the same people, very very warm, um, friendly. Um, a fantastic football club and let's say I'm thankful for everything that they did for me and hopefully yeah, I managed to help them on on um, on the pitch as well so great so, time yeah well we'd like to thank you for everything that you did for us um, you were there for the golden period of of our recent history and uh, you know, thank you very much for everything that you've done and thank you for your time again today pleasure As you can tell from the interview, um, Jason Wilcox was a fantastic interview. We gave very long, detailed answers. And we didn't get quite into everything that we wanted to get into post-title winning season, but fantastic insight from um, Jason Wilcox there. You know, we I knew about his difficulties with the, some of the Rover supporters, and I did wonder whether to bring that up, but he brought that up himself. And I think the way that he spoke about it, um, I can certainly see how that would help him with the young players at Manchester City and um, having those personal experiences and I wonder whether the fans look back on the way that we treated Jason Wilcox and wonder whether that would be whether that is such a, a good thing uh, but it has repeated itself with the likes of Ben Brereton this season and it's not nice to see when it does happen but um, you could th- you could also sense his disappointment that he wasn't there, he wasn't involved on the day in both the playoff final and the, the title winning final. And I felt really quite upset when he was talking about how he didn't feel like he didn't know what to do with himself on those days when he'd actually made massive contributions to both campaigns. And there's probably no way he would have been in either position without his contributions. So hopefully he does look back on those things as positives rather than, you know, just the title day itself or the promotion day itself um, being a disappointment to him. But I hope you enjoyed the interview and um, please stay tuned to Rovers Chat. Um, follow us on Twitter at Rovers underscore chat. Um, follow us on Facebook as well. We've got a page on there. We've got um, Instagram as well and a youtube channel with all sorts of podcasts and and stat shows on there as well um so please keep abreast of all rovers news and hopefully we'll be back on the pitch before you know it thank you everybody and uh we'll see you again soon